Hello, Cyboss community. It's fantastic to be here with you as we discuss ways of recharging global finance. I'm delighted to be here in conversation with a leader whose passion for the development of the African continent has led to constant innovation, elevation, and a support for those who do business here. Standard Bank has really been a game changer for financial services in this part of the world. Now, one of the new buzzwords is future ready transformation. So I'm looking forward to finding out his views about this. I'm also interested to see how issues like digital acceleration and risk management are being pursued in these really difficult times. Sitting with me is the group chief executive for Standard Bank, Sim Shabalala. Sim, welcome so much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your views as you address the Cybos community. Perhaps we can start off with the COVID world disrupted supply chains around the world, it's overwhelmed businesses, it's overwhelmed individuals. How have you coped as a leader, as an individual, and how has the Standard Bank Group managed to deal with the pandemic? So Lerato, thank you very much, and thank you to uh, SWIFT and the Cybos community. It's a wonderful opportunity to be chatting to you and to our friends and colleagues and partners. COVID is clearly a one in a hundred year uh, global crisis. Um, a plague actually not dissimilar to plagues that have been seen in human history. If you go back to the plague of Justinian, to the Antonine Plague, to the plague of Athens, and they all follow similar patterns. Uh, people are unable to travel as a consequence. Again, throughout history, that's been the case. Uh, there's social dislocation, which I think I'm sure you'll want to talk about a bit later. There is social conflict that arises from it. Um, and you have to innovate and learn to do th things in a different way. It's wonderful that even in that crisis, we're able to have conversations such as these, we're able to have cybos, and we're able to conduct business. Uh, but in those contexts, it's the winners are those that are able to adjust, to change the way they operate and, uh, and, and cope with that kind of environment. I think what we found is that uh, our people have been under incredible stress, so when I think about both our own staff and our clients, it's been a very, very difficult time. Um, our staff has found it difficult to uh, make decisions, um, to negotiate, because again, if you just think about Cybos, there's nothing like the serendipity of attendance at the meeting. But if you're doing it on those TV screens uh, or, or monitors, it's much more, much more difficult. I do hope that we'll be able to be traveling soon um, to be able to have these meetings uh, again. Turning to clients, uh, our consumers have had a very rough time over the last year and a half. So have our small to medium enterprise clients, uh, especially those businesses that are involved in the consumer side, um, especially uh, the restaurants uh, and so forth. Um, and then of course, there are other of our clients who've done exceptionally well, mm. people involved in digital activity. Yeah. Um, logistics. Yeah. Um, so it's been a, a very difficult period. And a mixed bag from what you're saying. Quite right. Now, every country has had its experience of this crisis um, and the kind of pressures, social pressures you've spoken about. But in South Africa, it seems to have taken a turn um, that's quite unique and specific to the local conditions. Just give me a sense of how South Africa as a country has managed this pandemic and its ensuing economic effects. So again, I, I suppose when you think about catastrophes throughout history, they all follow the same pattern again. So again, if you think about the great mortality of uh, 1347, 1348, in the UK it was followed by a riot in, the, in 1381, the peasant uh, revolt in the UK. In South Africa, we've got uh, high levels of poverty, inequality, unemployment, it is no surprise, it's like a tinderbox waiting for a match. It's no surprise that when you've got conflict and you've got want and you've got degradation, um, something will spark. And I think something similar happened. It was always bound to, to happen where, um, yeah, uh, people are hungry, uh, there's conflict, there's political contestation, and that confluence of factors causes uh, a massive social dislocation like you saw in the riots. Let's talk about those riots of July 2021 because they've caught many investors by surprise. It seems like they caught some of the politicians by surprise. But as you're saying, it was a tinderbox. They shouldn't have been surprised. Why? Because that is what happens throughout 
history. Whenever you look at uh, disease, uh, when you look at wars, etc., it's bound to happen where you've got poor people who um, are seeing uh, uh, assets being wasted, they're seeing corruption, and they're seeing opportunities uh, uh, escape them. But let's just turn to South Africa and talk a little bit more about those rights and what happened. I think what is true to say is that pursuant to the rights, things have gone back to normal again. Normal as it then was, the status quo ante. Uh, it illustrates that South Africans are very respectful of law. So the rule of law does exist in South Africa. Institutions actually do work. And I think we're seeing a response by the authorities that illustrates the fact that the law enforcement agencies are back. The real issue, though, is are we going to have structural reforms in the medium to long term that address the causes of that social dislocation that we spoke about. So it's quite important that the authorities continue with dealing with law and order. They continue with uh, strengthening of institutions, but then deal with logistics and energy, which are the two biggest pillars around which the South African economy would have to grow if we were to grow at above trend growth of, of 2%. And create the jobs that are quite right. so desperately needed. Okay, so this is what's happening in South Africa right now. But as you're saying, you know, we've seen the negative, but out of that, um, some opportunities are emerging. When we look at the rest of sub-Saharan Africa and how countries have shown resilience, innovative policies, as it were, what's your take on how the rest of the African continent is going to come out of this COVID pandemic? So thinking about South Africa, South Africa's response to the pandemic was very much driven by science and we followed a hard lockdown with severe economic uh, difficulties. So the economy in 2020 declined by roughly 7%. It's likely to bounce back to 4% this year and go uh, probably grow at around 2% in subsequent years. It would have grown at roughly 4.6%, but for the rights that you and I were speaking about. When you look at the rest of the continent, uh, the rest of the continent didn't have firstly a severe an impact of COVID. As a consequence, they didn't have as severe uh, lockdowns. The consequence is that they have a higher base than the rest of the world in relative terms. And so the IMF predicts that the economy of the continent will grow, uh, sub-Saharan Africa will grow roughly 3.1%, uh, and then trend upwards uh, in the medium to long term. And we have no reason to disagree with them. We actually agree that that's likely to be the trend. Um, with South Africa at 4% and going back to 2%. Now, the region is a very complex region. The oil producers, particularly in West Africa, um, are likely to struggle unless they diversify their economies. Whereas the oil importers, the East Africans, with very sophisticated policies and with them working hard to insert themselves into global value chains, particularly those of the Asia, of Asia and the, and the Pacific, they are likely to grow at roughly 5%. In fact, they've been growing at roughly 5%, but they're likely to grow faster. If you go back to West Africa, you've got Ghana, roughly 6%. So it's a, it depends. It's a portfolio. Generally, when you then think about the response to COVID, I think it's going to be a case of how quickly the continent rolls out its vaccines. We definitely have the capacity to roll them out much faster than people had assumed right. we could. COVAX has not done as well as we had thought it would, but I think there is evidence that we will be able to roll them out quite, quite fast. And I think for many people, the question is, how quickly do we get to herd immunity? So it's not just about the procurement through COVAX. It's also about getting the systems in place to get people, to get people yeah. um, vaccinated. And it's a bit patchy, I'd say. It's patchy, but the continent has got directly relevant experience off the back of malaria. Uh, and historically, we've shown our capacity in West Africa, for example, with Ebola to be able to deal with, uh, with pandemics. So the systems actually on the continent to distribute vaccines and get them on people's, in people's uh, arms is, is actually there. So we'll get to herd immunity faster? We should hopefully. be able. There's no reason why we shouldn't. You know. Okay, let's talk about those prospects in that near future. Where do they lie on home soil? So here in South Africa, I think the prospects lie in, as I said, uh, the refurbishing of our uh, logistics, our ports and our roads infrastructure 
as well as power generation mm -hmm. um, in the case of South Africa. I think when you think about the rest of the continent um, and the interplay between South Africa and the continent, you will see that Africans are getting healthier, they're getting wealthier, they're getting more productive at the same time as the rest of the world is getting older. And so uh, there's clear evidence that on the retail side, there are definitely opportunities for financial institutions. On the corporate side, it's also pretty clear that there's an investment boom that is likely to take off, as I indicated here in South Africa, but also in East Africa with them inserting themselves in global value chains. And so there's prospects for corporates to support that infrastructure build, build out. Indeed, uh, both in retail and wholesale, there's accelerated digitization as a consequence of firstly COVID, but also as a consequence of changing competitive uh, dynamics. Um, as the world is changing, Africans are becoming more and more connected. So there's evidence that in the last 10 years, uh, the number of cell phone connections has doubled to half a billion uh, and is likely to go to a billion by 2024. Uh, cell phone and people connected to the internet uh, mob in, in a mobile way, that is likely to be roughly a billion by 2025. And if you then in financial services in that context, it's pretty clear that the opportunities for facilitating payments and other financial deepening is, is incredibly, incredibly exciting. When you turn your attention to insurance and asset management, the same story. Um, as people get healthier and wealthier, and as financial deepening continues, you have pension fund reforms, people then buy insurance products, the wealthy get more sophisticated asset management products and therefore a financial services organization positioned in that context is bound to do very, very well. So, I mean, earlier on when you, when you referenced um, the kinds of things that could fuel growth in a South African context, uh, you spoke to infrastructure, logistics and um, energy, but clearly here there's a big opportunity, as you're saying, in digitization, uh, fintech, uh, new kinds of financial services and products all through connectivity. So do you want to talk to us about what the future of a standard bank looks like in Africa and perhaps for any other investment opportunities as well? Indeed, uh, there was a time not too long ago when people were saying fintechs and big techs were going to be eating the lunch of financial institutions. Yeah. Now they're saying, well, perhaps we'll be sharing lunch. We'll be buying, <laughs> in other words, we'll be in partnership because yeah. I think people have learned even in international contexts, our colleagues will know that uh, in places where there's open banking, it's not been that easy for fintechs and for telcos to enter the space. It's not been as easy as they thought it would be. As a consequence, they're entering into partnerships with financial institutions. Um, the need to comply with uh, anti-money laundering, with terrorist financing, the risk managers that you have to hire, the compliance uh, risks that you take on, makes it necessary for them to enter into partnerships rather than compete on their own. The consequence of that then is that it's pretty clear that while there will be new entrants eating away at uh, uh, certain segments and payments, um, there will continue to be a need for financial institutions. Those financial institutions that will survive are those that adapt most quickly and protect the customer interface and then also partner properly with the, the, the different techs. This proposition applies as much in the retail space as it does uh, in the wholesale space. Using the example of the Africa free trade area, uh, we are working very closely with the authorities, um, trying to help them uh, deal with the non-tariff barriers and talking to them about using blockchain, artificial intelligence, in order to provide products and services that reduce the friction that arises from, uh, from traditional payments. And so, for example, by using uh, these techniques, you can reduce the time it takes and the cost associated with issuing a guarantee uh, by roughly 90, 90%. And so my point is that in retail, there are opportunities as there are uh, in wholesale, and the winners are going to be those that uh, disrupt themselves and are able to work with those that disrupt them in partnership. Sim, you use the term reducing friction for the customer. What do you mean by that? And how does transitioning into a full platform business enable you to reduce those kinds of frictions? Indeed, Lorato. You know, 
uh, there was a time when um, if you wanted to have a financial service, you'd buy a product yeah. and the banks would sell you products. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's still a lot of uh, room for that. There was also a time when if you wanted the fish and chips, you'd go to the fish and chip shop. <laughs> You wanted to then go and do your groceries, you'd go to the corner cafe maybe and so forth. Whereas uh, just before our meeting now, I went to a mall. And in that mall, there was everything that I needed. I needed to get a photograph because I needed to get a visa from the American authorities. I needed to buy myself a cup of coffee. Um, and then I decided I needed to buy myself a book. And all of that happened in a mall. The same happens when somebody purchases a house. They don't want... They're not purchasing a house and are desirous just of a loan. They are actually wanting to purchase a house. And therefore, they need a payment. They need to borrow. They need the insurance. They need lo help with logistics. They may need help with um, security. In that context, we provide them with a solution at Standard Bank called look -C. In that sense, they're in a mall when they go and purchase their home and they choose what they would like, and they're in one place, they don't have to have the friction of buying things more than once. So that, that is on the, uh, on the retail side. So making it seamless. Making it seamless. Somebody wants to buy goods. They don't want a guarantee. They want to import plant and machinery. And therefore, we've got a solution called Trade Plus, which provides us with an opportunity to help them uh, interface with the logistics providers, make the payment that is necessary, and, and so forth. And so there are many examples one could give. In our case, we've got five ecosystems of this nature that we want to be curators of, or people who coordinate, and there are five we want to just be participants, where we are participating in other people's uh, ecosystems. The one example there would be an ecosystem called Power Pulse. Okay. And what we do there is we help and provide people with connections to generators of power and we help them with their financing. So we've moved beyond simply providing products and services, we're providing people with solutions in a seamless way, taking out the friction of acquiring financial services. From what you've said, I'm wondering how much of what you do is still bank in its traditional sense banking and how much is facilitation in the way you're talking about it? So I think there's no question that we will remain a bank and a financial services organization for the foreseeable future, for as long as you and I are, uh, are alive. However, we will be providing people with products and services that facilitate their lives through activities that are adjacent to financial services. This is fantastic. As we wind down the conversation, you've spoken to so many opportunities despite COVID, despite civic unrest. And I think for that, we also need to throw in the caveat, there's been unrest in Europe over COVID. So it's not a uniquely South African problem. And of course, you've spoken to the, Democrat, uh, to the demographic dividend and the opportunities that lie ahead. What would be your final thoughts to those saying, mm, is Africa still the place to do business? Is Africa really where you're going to get great returns, great opportunities? My summary, Lerato, would be the African continent has got the world's best demographics. As I said, the population is getting younger, healthier, wealthier, and more productive. Anybody who is involved in the retail part of financial services, whether it be payments, uh, insurance, asset management, will have vast opportunities if they are correctly positioned. Likewise, um, the continent is in continuous refurbishment of its infrastructure and building out its infrastructure. If you just think about our ports, and if you think about the ports on the east, eastern uh, seaboard, it's incredible the amount of investment that is going in there. And so if you're a business that is facing off to corporates, the opportunities are vast. And therefore, uh, with the east, as I said, growing at 5%, uh, with a continent likely to grow at a trend growth rate of above 4%, uh, with financial deepening continuing, the opportunities for financial services are just vast. They're enormous. Sim, thank you so much for your time. And it's really great that we're able to engage with each other face to face. But I must say, all COVID protocols have been observed. It's been my pleasure. And I think there are many people watching who might have missed the opportunity to attend Cybos this year uh, had it been face to face. So always the two sides of the coin working in this digital world. Now some great positive insights and delightfully frank 
uh, thought leadership and inspiration that's come through from Sim Shabalala, the group chief executive for Standard Bank. We spent some time discovering Standard Bank's commitment to a future-ready transformation through digital acceleration, technological innovation, managing risk, and also pursuant of greater diversity and sustainability, many of which are already seeing positive results. Those great perspectives from the Standard Bank Group, I wish you the very best for the remainder of Cybos. From myself, Lerat Mbele, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.